guys again for all being here. We have some guests for you that are going to speak. Um, I'd like to introduce Miss Suzanne Elsie. Good morning, everyone. Before I get started, and while she's pulling up the PowerPoint, I just wanted to take a minute to tell all of you how excited I am to be here. Not that I'm glad that I have a story to tell, but anytime I have the chance to tell my story, especially to kids that are around your age, I jump at the chance. And people's always asking me, why do I want to tell my story? Well, the first reason has to do with a promise that I made to my son, which I'm going to tell you about here, a little bit more in a few minutes. The second reason is because on Wednesday, April 10th of last year, I began to live every mother's worst nightmare. There's a lot of people here today that can vouch for this, people that knew my son, there's actually people who you saw outside in the rescue equipment who actually helped cut my son out of the car after it crashed during almost 100 miles an hour. My son was one of the four kids who, one of the four boys who was killed last Wednesday, April 10th on Cox Neck Road. And the four boys lost their lives because they made a bad choice. I've heard the word accident said here a lot today. I hear that all the time. It wasn't an accident. No, they didn't set out to hurt anyone, hurt themselves. They didn't mean for anything to go wrong. These were probably four of the most incredible boys you'd ever want to meet. And I'll tell you more about my son here in just a minute. <clears throat> but it's not an accident because the term accident means something that's not preventable. And what resulted that day was very preventable. They made a choice. As a driver, as passengers, they made a bad choice. And because of that bad choice, it cost them their lives. So anytime I have a chance to get out in front of young people like you, and especially at this time of the year, May happens to be the worst month for uh, teen driving fatalities. You guys have prom coming up and, and graduation in a couple weeks. Congratulations, by the way, to you seniors. <laughs> yeah, you should be proud of yourself. These four boys, my son, Tyler Elsey, and his, his best friends, Harrison and Mike and Corey. That's Tyler there, by the way. They graduated 10 months before the crash. Just 10 months. And they had the world at their doorstep. They had a lot of hopes. They had a lot of dreams. They were best friends. Tyler and Harrison were best friends for years and years. And in fact, years ago, Tyler wrote on a little whiteboard in Harrison's room, I love broski. And you'll actually see, oh, there it is. He wrote that years ago. That message is still on the whiteboard in Harrison's room today. And on Wednesday, April 10th, they died together because they all made that bad choice. You know, when we, when we hear a plane, of a plane crashing, <laughs> you never hear it referred to as a plane accident because usually it was preventable. And that was the same, same thing with, with this crash. Were they texting? I couldn't tell you. Why were they doing almost 100 miles an hour? We can't tell you that either because none of them survived to tell us. When the rescue people got there to the scene, it was too late. They were gone. They were killed instantly. I'm not going to go into the details of the injuries that my son experienced. And as you can see, he was a firefighter and an EMT. Of all people, I never dreamed that my son, who was a firefighter and an EMT, would be a passenger irresponsibly, or be involved in this type of a crash, he's usually the ones responding to the crashes. He's usually the, the one cutting the people out of the car, not being cut out of the car. But on that day, it was him. They actually had to send Cun Island back 
to their station and bring in Goodwill and Graysonville and Churchill. They even got some uh, resources from Talbot County. They said it was the worst and most horrific car crash that had ever been on Kent Island. And I never dreamed it would happen to my son. None of us ever think it's going to happen, happen to us. Right? It couldn't happen to you, could it? It just doesn't happen. Not on Kent Island especially. Nothing happens on Kent Island except for that day. Tyler had a dream. I told you I, I would tell you about my promise to Tyler. He came home to me one night after being on a fire call, and he was literally glowing. And he said to me, Mom, I had to tell you about a call I was on tonight, which shocked me because he never shared stories from the firehouse with me. He'd always say, can't tell you, Mom, HIPAA regulations. But that night, he wanted to share the story. He had had a call and was one of the first on the scene for a cardiac arrest. And he was able to, with another firefighter, perform CPR. And by the time the paramedics got there, the man had a heartbeat. And they got him to the hospital. He said, Mom, his wife came up to me sobbing and hugged me so tight and said, thank you for saving my husband. Thanks to you, my kids still have a father. On that day, Tyler made a decision he was going to spend the rest of his life saving lives. That's what he was going to do. He was committed. He never got to live that dream. Instead, he became a statistic. That was his big accomplishment after that day. A big, he became a statistic like 3,000 other teens become a statistic every year. What you see on that screen is when on that afternoon I was leaving work, my oldest son had called, asked what was going on in Kent Island, told me there had been a very bad crash and that there were several people involved, possibly kids. He's a, a firefighter at Churchill, which is where Tyler started out, by the way. <clears throat> well, when I tried 15 times to call my son and he didn't respond, you can just imagine. I, I want all of you to think right now about your own mothers or the person who really cares about you the most. Think about what they would feel trying 15 times to call you after knowing there's just been a hell of a crash in your community. Think about the, the fear that would set in. When I first got to the scene, I couldn't get close enough to see the cars. All I saw was emergency vehicles everywhere. I knew Tyler was in that car and I actually ran up to um, some emergency responders there screaming at them saying, I know my son was in that car and I need to know he's alive. You could have heard a pin drop. Even though there were hundreds of people at the crash site, nobody said a word. They just looked at each other. As soon as I, as soon as I told them who it was, they said, they said, who's your son? I said, Tyler Elsie. They just looked at each other. No one would say a word. That was the reaction when they told me that Tyler was dead. And not only did they tell me Tyler was dead, they told me Harrison was dead, then they told me Mike was dead, and then they told me Corey was dead. The last thing I remember was calling my daughter. I remember standing on the side of Cox Neck Road screaming, not Tyler, he saves lives. That's all he wanted to do was save, save lives. You have the wrong kid. But they didn't. The last thing I remember was calling my daughter. And she, she picked up the phone and she says, was it Tyler? That's all she said. I said, yes. She said, is he dead? I said, yes, he's gone. I heard the world's loudest scream I've ever heard in my life. And then the phone dropped to the ground, and so did she. And from that day on, my family's never been the same. Those are the marks on the road where, when they approached a slight bend, somewhere, doing somewhere between 76 and 97 miles per hour, the driver lost control. They lost control, went across the center line, and hit an oncoming car. 
they were T-boned, and it made impact on Tyler and Mike's side. I will tell you this, my son, who was six foot one, I later had to read a four-page autopsy report. They measured him at five foot seven because every bone in his body was broken. The only consolation I had was that I know he was killed instantly. I know this because his heart ruptured and his brain stem severed. When your brain stem severs, it's instant death. But that's what happens when you're driving that fast and you come to a sudden stop. The driver of the other car fortunately survived. He was the innocent victim in all this. My sons were, you know, my son was just out trying to have a good time. They haven't seen each, hadn't seen each other in a long time. It was a gorgeous day, the most beautiful day of the year so far that, that year. They didn't mean to hurt anybody. We talk about distracted driving. Distracted driving is not just texting or using your cell phone. A report came out two weeks ago I read, and actually having multiple team passengers in one car is actually even four times more distracting than any other type of distraction. You all have a right and a responsibility as passengers and as, and as drivers. You have a right to get where you're going safely, and you have a responsibility not to distract the driver, not to be rowdy. Of course, these were 18 and 19-year-old kids. I don't know an 18 or 19-year-old kid that wasn't rowdy. And look what it got them. The worst thing I had to do was to plan Tyler's funeral. And to be honest, I don't really remember it. Thank God my sisters were there to help me plan it. I couldn't have done it. The only part I remember was walking into a room, seeing nothing but casket facings. And I had to choose a casket for my son. 19 years old. 10 months earlier, he saved a man's life. That was the hardest thing I've ever had to do. The first time I visited the cemetery after his memorial service, I tried to dig him up. No, I'm not crazy, I'm not loony, but as a mother, when you go to a cemetery and you realize that your child is laying six feet below the ground, it's devastating. That's the memorial that was quickly set up for the boys. It affected our entire community. Our community was torn apart. I know that you guys have suffered tragedies as well in the community. I know that you know what I'm talking about when I say that it impacts everybody. And this was, this was, an, uh, it was an, a, a preventable crash that destroyed four lives, four families. I have a grandson, and you'll see a, a letter he wrote Tyler not long ago, asking him, his uncle Tyler, why he doesn't talk to him anymore. <laughs> why, do, why don't you come around? He knows he's dead, but he doesn't understand that. So trying to explain to grandchildren where uncle Tyler went, these are things I have to do every single day. You guys have a great weekend coming up this weekend. It's prom. We all talk about drinking and driving. We talk about our cell phones. And I hope none of you do anything like that. But you got to remember, it's a lot more than that. There's the letter there. All Tyler wanted to do was save lives. And who knows, he might have been on a fire call with some of you at some point in time. He could have saved your life at some point. I received so many letters after the crash, people thanking me. Matter of fact, when I, when I chose his, his plot at the cemetery, I was thanked by the, the gentleman. He said, you know, I just want to tell you a story. He said, I never knew your son, but your son helped deliver my granddaughter, helped welcome her into the world the night of the hurricane. He held her hand because they couldn't get her to the hospital in time. And 
he, Mike Tyler held his daughter's hand while she delivered the baby. Never told me that story. Again, HIPAA regulations. But he didn't boast or brag. He just went out there and did a job. He did what he loved to do, and that was save lives. And that was a dream he didn't get to fulfill. I mentioned earlier about the promise that I made to Tyler. That day at the cemetery when I first lost my head for a minute and was going to dig him up. <laughs> Thank God I didn't. I told him, I made a promise. I said, I know you wanted to save lives. I know how much it meant to you. So I am, that's why I'm here today. That's why I go to the reset programs. Any chance I get, I tell my story. I live, relive the worst day of my life over and over and over and over. And I do that because if I can get people to listen and realize that it does happen to you, it happens right here in our community, and realize what happens, what the result is to families that are left behind. Because believe me, I had a kid at the reset program tell me that once. Well, I'm, if I'm dead, why do I care? Well, if you, if you care about anybody in this world that would be left behind, you should care. Because I am now, unfortunately, as the other parents are, doomed to a life of... I can't, even, I can't even find words to explain it. I'll never have another Mother's Day present from him. I saved the last bottle of Wawa peach tea that he loved so much. Because it was the last bottle he drank when he came home one night from work and was talking to me. It was the last conversation we had. So to me, it's priceless. It was a great memory. And I had my house cleaned about a month ago, and whoever cleaned it, the people that cleaned it, threw it away. You would have thought I was a mad woman. You should have seen me going through bags of garbage and trash trying to find this stupid little bottle. Because to them it was trash, it was nothing. But to me, it was the last moment I got to spend with my son. I know some of you are, are I seen you, see, I've noticed you looking at me holding my necklace. It's the only physical part of Tyler I have left. It's his thumbprint. And yeah, it's a little skewed because his body was very skewed. It's the only part I have left and I hold on to it when I, talk, when I do these presentations and talks just because it helps me feel closer to him. So the promise, what I want you to do to help me keep my promise to Tyler, I do have a request. I would like to ask all of you here today is there, all of you here drive, I'm assuming, probably pretty much all of you. I want you to commit to me to five miles. That's all I'm asking, and let me explain why. These boys drove down Cox Neck Road, turned around. They only went a quarter of a mile. A quarter of a mile before they crashed. And at over 90 miles an hour, I don't think that took them very long. And they only had about five miles to go before they would have gotten to their final destination, gotten back home safely. Had they not been distracted, not been speeding, he would have been saving lives today. So help me save lives. I'll never be able to quantify it, and that's okay. But if everyone here can commit to just driving five miles totally safe, safe no texting, no cell phones, no friends, no being rowdy, and most importantly, drive the speed limit. If you could commit to those, those things for five miles, if everyone here can do that for just one weekend, I guarantee you, you're going to save a life. And then maybe next year there won't be another mother just like me here to tell you a story. Because believe me, it's not good to have a story to tell. I have a website, crewsafe.org. You're welcome to go to it. I have some dri safe driving tips on there, videos, stories of the boys. I always like to talk about the boys. Because they did exist. I'm also available on Facebook. 
You can get me personally if you ever have questions. If you ever want to know how to get out of how to get out of driving situations, I'm willing to help you with that as well. I'll do whatever it takes to save a life because I, I made that promise to my son. I want you guys all to be able to come back for your, your 5, 10, 20 year reunions. I don't want any of you to become another statistic in the next few months or even this weekend. So can I get you to commit to the five miles? Can you do that for me? Help me save lives for Tyler. Okay, well, thank you very much. For you seniors out there, congratulations. You should be really proud of yourself. And for, your, for you, all you juniors out there, congratulations to you too, because you'll finally be seniors next year. Enjoy it. It's a great time of life. Have fun, but most of all, be safe. Thank you very much.